personality and psychotherapy is what we've been discussing today. Week 11, welcome everybody. Um, this is a week or a module rather where we are trying to bring everything together. We're trying to bring everything together from three main standpoints. So uh, we briefly discussed the stress response and emotions last week, and we introduced some concepts of reaction, interpretation, and existence in the context of addiction, for instance, how much the context plays a role and how much the interpretation on an emotional and cognitive level plays a role in the way we uh, react to things in the world. Today, we will be discussing psychotherapy and personality, and we will discuss this first approach. We will talk about the philosophy and the history of the concept of personality, and the third element will be the practical application of what we know in terms of personality to the clinical setting. So let's just review what we said last week um, a little bit about the three main emotions in regard to addiction, if you remember. So last week, we started a conversation, and if you remember, I meant to uh, discuss those three basic emotions, right? So happy neutral and sad, okay? Or sad, happy, and neutral. And if you remember, last week, we talked about this pendulum, okay? As an example, that could go back and forth to swing from left to right and right to left, depending on our circumstances, okay? And if you do remember, we also mentioned the fact that from a neurobiological standpoint, a chemical standpoint, the pendulum can move here or here, depending on what we did in our life. So for instance, if let's say we are creating an artificial level of happiness by using certain stimulants, for instance, if you remember this whole portion of quote unquote happiness or a manic state, hypomanic state, is part of the happiness and hypomania are not the same thing. We mentioned that a huge portion of this pendulum will exist in happiness, okay? And the rest will be the corresponding area in the negative sense. So since the brain cannot resist this too long with too much intensity, if you remember, the brain did something like this. So that even if we would have the same level of happiness, okay? in order for the brain to make up for this artificial stimulation. Now you have the second curve, okay? And if this first curve represented this angle, let's say alpha one, the second will be alpha two, okay? Alpha two. And at this point, it doesn't matter how much stimulation you have, you have only a limited portion of happiness that constitutes the perceptive happiness. The rest, okay, because this pen is here, okay, will already at baseline be very, very close to sadness, which also means that you will need more stimulation to feel the same way. Because if something bad or negative inducing happened here, okay, at this level here, okay, then you will have only a certain amount of that sadness left. But if you do this artificially, the brain makes up for its overstimulation. And now at this point, you see how much bigger the area of sadness is going to be. Okay? So this swinging back and forth is not just a metaphor, is the neural underpinnings of this emotional uh, backbone to both addiction and emotion in general. Now, since we understood this going back and forth and the level of absorption and tolerance, all those those uh, uh, the scriptures that we discussed last week, we are switching gears a little bit here. So let's assume that these three faces, these three emotions are still there. And of course, there are more than three. We talked about Paul Ekman, we talked about multiple theories, but let's assume that these are still the only three possibilities, okay? How would we know whether these three are predicated upon an innate element or it's something that we can learn? Again, is it nature or nurture? Why are some people at baseline happier than others? And what are some people 
more, if not sad, at least maybe negative about things than others. Now, notice what I said here, negative about things. Now, this is an essential component of the discussion here, because when we talk about personality, we will talk about being uh, ha having a, a reaction to something out there as opposed to something that is inside of us. This will be the main core of the conversation, okay? So if we were to simplify things here, okay, the question might be, why? Why are we we? <laughs> okay? Notice that this we could also become an us. What's the difference? Well, this one would be the subject, right? The subject nominative, and this would be the what? The object, direct or not, doesn't matter, in an accusative sense. What does it mean? If we're asking this question to ourselves, this question also means, why are we this way, this way? Okay. Assuming there are multiple ways to exist. So two things to be in mind here. First, that the moment we are analyzing how we are in terms of, again, emotions, thoughts, behaviors, et cetera, et cetera, we become an object. And this will be an essential element of the conversation because as you will see, when we talk about testing, psychological testing, personality tests, and so on and so forth, it's really difficult to assess how much of the things we know of ourselves, or even more, the things that we think we display about ourselves to others are actually understood by others the same way as we do. So for instance, I might think of myself as very sociable, very kind, very outgoing, but other people might beg to differ. They might think of me as arrogant, as selfish, as even cold-hearted. So there might be a discrepancy there, okay? And We'll see how that plays a role into the uh, window of, of perception. So we go from we, subject, to us, object, even if we are the one asking this question. Okay? The moment we understand ourselves, the moment we, we look at ourselves, we become the object of our interpretation, first thing. Second thing, why are we this way? This also means there might be multiple ways to exist. Okay? So if this is a way, at this point, an added question may be, okay, so let's assume that there are four ways, okay? One, two, three, four ways of existence, okay? And you will see later why I picked the number four. If those are four ways of existence, okay, can we say that each of these ways is a personality, okay? Each way is a personality separate from the other three. Or perhaps if this is a personality, could this be specified as a personality type or trait or characteristic? So, for instance, I might think of myself as sociable. Okay, let's write a few adjectives here. Keep this in mind. Okay, these four elements. I might think of myself as sociable. Okay, sociable. I might think of myself as friendly. I might think of myself as outgoing. Okay. And another person, when asked about me, might think of myself, might think of, of me as cold-hearted, selfish, um, perhaps hardworking, etc. Now, a huge part of uh, personality psychology is understanding the connection between these terms. First of all, we need to understand whether some terms might be synonymical, okay? They might mean exactly the same thing or close things. So for instance, we could put in the same category, perhaps being 
sociable and outgoing, okay? And you might think, well, friendly should also be included. So if society, sociable, has to do with some element of out of myself, okay, something that I reach out to, the same thing can be said about being outgoing, okay? And you say, but isn't this the definition of having a friend, okay? Well, it might be because having friends means to have communication. So you might have the same thing, but friends can also be the opposite of a foe or an enemy, okay? So at this point, this one might be connected to this in an oppositional sense, as in I might be displaying certain selfish traits because I've been hurt in the past, because the people I thought as friends betrayed my trust, hurt me. So I'm not selfish in the sense of being narcissistically so, but selfish as a defense mechanism, which is another term that we borrow from psychoanalysis, which also has to do with the interpretation of these categories. Let's continue. What does it mean to be cold-hearted, okay, in an emotional sense? Well, if there are multiple ways to exist, if you can label someone as cold-hearted, you need to agree on the existence of someone who might be on the opposite side of the spectrum. Warm-hearted, okay? Okay, so this one has in opposition to this, right? And then you might think, who gets to judge what is warmth, what is coldness? And as you can see, as we create tests about personality, we need to understand there's always a bit of a bias, a bit of an inclusion of judgment in the way we relate to people. Notice, I left a term outside here, okay? Hardworking. You might think, was it random that you added hardworking on this side? Okay, so maybe this is a separation between the two. Could you have put hardworking here? Why is it hardworking connected to something negative here? Does it have to be? No, of course not. But you can see that our judgment might change the way we position this label. For instance, if all our friends there possess this hierarchy of needs or principles or of parameters of preferences, okay, of priorities that include caring for others, loving others, helping people in need, okay, volunteering. In that sense, hard working, was it hard working could only be included here if there is an ethical dimension to the work I'm doing. For instance, if I work for a company that produces harmful pesticides, okay, it might be harder to claim that this hard working thing could be applicable to this area, okay, as opposed to if I'm hard working in a food shelter, all right? So these are just examples. And, but you will see that there are some traits, some personality labels that contain more of a predictive power in terms of how we will see ourselves in the future. Just to give you one example, and then we'll discuss that uh, with the help of slides, the concept of conscientiousness, okay? In the big five is a high predictor of job performance first, and as we can see, with some correlation to job satisfaction. Keep in mind that satisfaction means to make something full, fulfilled, all right? So this is just an introduction, all right? And you might also wonder, all right, so if there are a few things about ourselves that are constructing to these four ways for now, okay? How can we construct these four ways, okay? Let's just add some random name to these ways, okay? Let's assume that someone is, I don't know, sad, depressed, melancholic, okay, et cetera, okay? And we might put this one as number one. So one is sadness, okay? Number two might be someone who is choleric or angry, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Number three might be someone, I don't know, uh, phlegmatic, okay? 
Now, as you can see here, as we organize these things, we have to do the very thing that we did with words. So should we put like one here and two here as opposites? And then by definition, or a segue three and four here, or maybe wait a second, there's an element of um, uh, of sadness here that's called this melancholic, okay? So that we don't have uh, the, the fourth, which usually is attributed to uh, sanguine or sanguinic. So are these correct? So can we say that a melancholic state is here in opposition to a choleric state, okay? Can we say that a phlegmatic state is an opposition to a sanguinic state? Or perhaps we should switch and maybe one is in opposition to four, okay? Okay, and three is in opposition to two, okay? What gives us the, the definition of this orientation? What is the other way around? Maybe two should be here, okay? And three should be here, okay? Okay, you might think, I lost you here. I'm not sure what all these terms mean, but don't you worry. We'll we'll describe what each of these elements are in the slides. So melancholic, sanguinic, phlegmatic, and choleric. But let's view this as other terms of perception. We, we talked about this in depth in our course so far. That everything we study in psychology has to be verifiable, at least from a scientific standpoint. So rather than thinking of emotions here, think about what could be a good perceptual element? Think about temperature. And the reason why I mentioned temperature or physical perception is because I know that you all know that there are certain neural underpinnings that are responsible for, for some element that are physical, right? For instance, a light touch, okay? Uh, for some element of pain and temperature, if you think about the parietal lobe, right? And the somatosensory cortex. So instead of looking at all these letters, let's just add some some easier terms, okay? Let's remove all the numbers, all these labels, okay? And let's assume that the way to exist in the world, okay, is predicated upon, again, four main elements, okay? At this level, this is just an introduction, okay? As we can see, there are some models that will involve five terms, like the big five, that are certain elements of uh, the history of personality, they will only four, but bear with me, this is just an intro. So let's assume that you can be either hot in your perception or cold, okay? Both in terms of temperature as well as overall emotional component. Think about being warm-hearted, okay? So again, hot could also be warm. And perhaps here you can put, I don't know, dry, and here you can put wet, okay? At this point, we're just using some sensory, sensory motor elements, some tactile experiences. So what does it mean to be right here? What does it mean to be hot and dry, okay? Think about thirst, for instance, okay? What does it mean to be cold and wet, okay? And getting sick, perhaps, okay? And what is the difference between these two poles here and their corresponding opposites on the other two uh, quadrants? What does it mean to be hot and wet, okay? And is being hot and wet more comfortable by juxtaposition and being cold and wet? What does it mean to be cold and dry? Is this more comfortable than being hot and dry, all right? So already at this stage, we see that as much as we can define ourselves as one of these four elements, assuming these are true, okay, you might have a warm personality, you might have a cold personality, etc. The likelihood of the interaction between these four ways is very, very high. And this is part of the way we conceptualize personality in psychology. This is one of the elements. The other element that we uh, will continue with is the psychotherapeutic approach. Now, psychotherapy, as I mentioned, is a, I won't call it a branch or a sub-branch of psychology, it's an application in the clinical setting of psychology, that each week we learn a little bit about it. Why is this? Because as we study methods, as we study neuroscience, as we study the theoretical framework of psychology, the way 
we are geared toward this or the direction will eventually determine what type of therapeutic modality we will utilize. Okay? So for instance, to stay at this level here, if the way we exist in the world, okay, across these four quadrants is innate, is innate, okay, meaning is quote unquote genetic, okay? And by that we mean fully genetic, okay? Then you might wonder, it's really hard to make the claim that psychotherapy or really any type of therapy works because we are doomed to be a certain way. Remember what we said in week one. So if those traits are universally stable, and they're stable in their extremes, okay, I'm fully hot, I'm fully cold, I'm fully wet, I'm fully dry, then the likelihood that we might change things might be negatively um, correlated to the genetic factors. Like for instance, let's switch terms. Rather than thinking of cold heart and warm heart, if I am uh, genetically shy, okay, doesn't matter how much therapy I'm doing, I will always be shy. Okay. Is this true? Well, research has indicated, and I would say to a very big extent, uh, common sense uh, appears to indicate that as well, that there, this concept of shyness could also exist on a spectrum. Okay. And that's where we see that if this is nature, okay, nature, okay. The environment will also, environment will play a role, and this will be nurture. Okay. So, for instance, think of yourself as a very shy kid if you were a shy child. And let's say you were not too fond of interacting with strangers or new friends. It's really, it was really hard for you to start a conversation. Even if you were going to the playground, you tend to be more of a loner. You didn't feel very comfortable interacting with others. As an adult, you might still have the same trait, let's call it trait for now, but you might be able to perform, quote unquote, better in a social context because you can keep your, quote unquote, shyness at bay. Now notice here that there are some performative elements. The fact that we are aiming at a goal okay, can help us heal from a problem, assuming that this is too much shyness, okay? assuming that this is something that we would like not to have to some extent, versus the fact that if everything is innate and unmovable, unchangeable, doesn't matter how much work we put into it, we will always compromise our uh, approach to others. So this is one of the uh, elements that we need to discuss. Many, many other things, but if instead everything will be on the nurture level, everything is about the environment or on the way we interpret the world, okay? If our personality has to do with interpretation, okay? Interpretation. Interpretation. This also means judgment. Okay, judgment, okay, which can be either correct or incorrect. We can make mistakes, okay? We might think of something as, I don't know, uh, yellow and say it's blue. We might think of someone as cold-hearted and turn out that the person is actually warm-hearted, et cetera, et cetera. So if we have problems with interpreting the world, then we can focus on the type of therapy that targets where the uh, mistakes are displaying their strength, where they're manifesting so themselves. So we can be make we can make mistakes in the way we think our thoughts, in the way we feel our emotions, and in the way we act, our behavior, our actions. Etc. Okay. And this is one of the modalities of understanding the connection between therapy and personality, something that you can work on. Okay. Now, granted, you can see the behavior displayed, you cannot read someone's mind, but the way they interact with the world, 
gives you an idea of what they're thinking, how they're feeling. Okay. But if some of that is not known to the person experiencing them, so in other words, I might not be aware of the emotions I'm displaying or the way I feel. I might think that I am calm, cool, and collected, but I really appear anxious, or I'm not be fully aware of my thoughts. Maybe I think that I am very uh, balanced inside, strong inside, but I'm falling apart internally. So we're moving from this ways personality of interpretation, this trait theory of personality, okay, to other types of interpretation. For instance, the psychodynamic and the psychoanalytic, whereby our personalities are constructed as an iceberg with multiple layers, some of which we might be aware of, some of which we might be partially aware of, and some of which we might be completely unaware of. We mentioned this a little bit when we talked about the, uh, the ego, the id, and the superego, and when we talked about Freud, and Jung, and Rank, and Adler, and Rizet. We will apply that today, yes, uh, in the context of personality, to see how that plays into psychotherapy, to juxtapose these two modalities. There are more, of course, than just trait theories of personality and psychodynamic psychological personality. But this is just a way to uh, to present to you how, as a psychologist, as a psychotherapist, as an instructor, as a clinician, as a researcher, you have to be very aware of what type of direction you're taking in order to study personality and how that will play a role in the way you help others. So let's begin with this quote uh, from Marcus Aurelius. Um, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. This is fundamental to understand what we're doing here today because there are multiple theories of personalities and based on each of these theories, you have theoretical frameworks and tests and assessments. Now, we are studying psychology to better understand ourselves and others, but this is especially important if we do this in a clinical setting to help our patients, our clients, and to better understand what motivates us, our thoughts, our behavior, our cognition, our emotions, what make us act in a certain way, what make us perceive the world a certain way. Now, we did already study the neural underpinnings of all these things in the previous 10 weeks, but it's really important to understand how much, I would say, transcendental control we have on our perception, more specifically in this case, on our personality and our happiness. Now, I start with Marcus Aurelius to um, emphasize how important it is to have a solid, balanced, and true philosophy of life. Now, regardless of the percentage of nature and nurture in terms of what makes us feel a certain way, it's really important to focus on the quality here. Quality both in terms of how close our thoughts, emotions, and behavior are to true, but also what type of traits our thoughts have. Now, this last word, traits, will be essential to understand the uh, connection between personality, psychotherapy, happiness, and health. Traits, all right? So let's start with some basic definitions here. Personality, a person's unique and relatively stable behavior patterns, the consistency of who you are, have been, and will become. Since we study personality, it is important to understand that tests will be valid if those traits, those characteristics, those patterns are somewhat consistent. They are stable so that the person you are now will be the same person in 10 years from now. Now, this does not necessarily apply to developmental aspects, okay? We need to study developmental psychology, child psychology, to better understand how this will become part of who we are. So, of course, as much as it is important to understand that certain traits are there since childhood, to call these traits innate will require a more profound analysis because everything changes. If you remember what we discussed about um, the cortex, especially the prefrontal cortex, and how 
uh, it is representative of a later behavior in comparison to our limbic system, okay? But if you take a test when you're 25 or you're 35 or you're 65, the results should be consistent. This does not mean, of course, that some of your answers might be predicated upon the type of struggles, challenges that you go through in your life. So you should not have the exact same behavior, same thought, same emotion. But the overall perspective should be consistent. Okay? So this is personality. The term personality, if you remember, is connected to the persona. Okay, So to the mask that ancient Greeks and Roman actors put on to change the way they sounded in the context of theater, okay? Sona from the way something sound, okay? Sono, sonos, and uh, per in order to. So the persona, personality, is the way we manifest ourselves uh, outside to others. And it's another important uh, element here. We can discuss personality, we can discuss psychotherapy in connection to other people, the way we are interpreted by others and the way we think we appear to others. Another definition, character, personal characteristics that have been judged or evaluated, okay? What type of um, overall uh, judgment, in the sense clinical, but also social, uh, our presentation is deemed to be. Temperament, hereditary aspect of personality, including sensitivity, moods, irritability, and adaptability. This is essential because it's connected to the term humor, and we'll see how that is consistent since antiquity. Personality trait, stable qualities that a person shows in most situations. Personality type, people who have several, several traits in common. All right, so let's see what the modern personality theories are uh, overall. Okay, it's a sum, um, summary. And by modern, I really mean in the last roughly speaking, 150 to 100 years, all right? And then we'll see how that is connected uh, to some bigger or smaller extent to uh, psychology in antiquity. Personality theory, system of concepts, assumptions, ideas, and principles proposed to explain personality includes at least five perspectives, a summary, okay? Trait theory, psychodynamic theories, behavioristic theories, social learning theories, and humanistic theories. And we'll spend some time on each of these. The first one, trait theories attempt to learn what traits make a personality and how they relate to actual behavior. Psychodynamic theories connected to analysis and psychoanalysis focus on the inner workings of personality, especially internal conflicts and struggles. We'll talk about subconscious, preconscious, we'll talk about Freud, Jung, Rank, etc. Behavioristic theories, they focus on external environment and on effects on conditioning and learning. We spent a lot of time on that in week uh, five. Social learning theories, you should remember what we said about Vygotsky and Bandura. They attribute differences in perspective to socialization, expectation, and mental processes. Now, there's con constant development on each of these theories, and one uh, um, psychologist researcher within this area could be Uri Brofenbrenner, the ecological theory. And then humanistic theories um, also connected to person-centered theories, um, um, positive psychology theories, they focus on private subject experience and personal growth. Now, humanism in itself, I think we mentioned this in week three and six, if I'm not mistaken, is to only a small extent connected to humanism, that social, um, philosophical, and political movement that um, originated in the 1400 and 1500 um, in Italy, more specifically in Tuscany. And therefore, we should not conclude that humanistic theories are either uh, a precursor to transhumanism, for instance, in philosophy and artificial intelligence or computer science, or it should be viewed as anti-philosophical, anti-spiritual, or anti-religious theories. Humanistic theories you should view as human-centered. Now, some of them might be more critical than others, and some of them might have a political connotation, but overall, uh, humanistic theories is a big, big umbrella. And it is another big umbrella to consider the next one, temperaments and humors in general. Now, whether we are talking about Avicenna, um, the 
Persian polymath that we discussed in the past, when we're talking about Hippocrates or Galen or Aristotle or all the way to Aquinas, those temperaments and humors are an essential part of how humanity understood itself in terms of personality, health, traits, um, emotions, behaviors, and thoughts throughout human history. These are just two examples, and um, I have a specific um, uh, playlist dedicated to these aspects. Uh, and in fact, if you want to find out a little more about um, Avicenna specifically, I will uh, link that uh, lecture below. But the idea is that there are four main ways to exist in the world, okay? And those four main ways are called temperaments, okay? Both in a physiological and physical sense, okay? Think about uh, the way uh, swords are forged, for instance, as well as humors, which is connected to both the external manifestation of a feeling, an emotion, thinking about sense of humor, but also physiological response process and mechanism, including from a chemical standpoint. So there are certain elements of chemistry fluids, liquids in our bodies. And of course, the way we interpret those fluids, those liquids, is slightly different from the way Galen, Hippocrates, and Avicenna interpret that. But they're still consistent with the way we interpret neurotransmitter, for instance. So those physical elements will have an impact in the way we feel, we think, and we behave. So there's a connection just as much as there's a connection between serotonin and dopamine, etc., and the way we feel and think. And so there is a connection between these temperaments, and humors. Now, we mentioned some symbolic elements between the number four here and other uh, cultural frameworks with number three, for instance, both in the um, monotistic um, tradition as well in the Far East, the, the number five, for instance, in the um, Chinese or Tibeto-Chinese tradition, think of um, the, the concept of the qi, think of acupuncture, um, think of uh, the five elements. And again, this will take a longer time to analyze in an anthropological historical sense. So for now, we stick to the most consistent view of temperance and humors, which is the Roman, Greek, and Persian tradition, the Unani tradition, that views in four main elements the four types of people that exist in the world. And for each type, you have certain characteristics. As you can see here, you have some psychological terms, introvert, emotionally unstable, extrovert, emotionally stable. So you have two possible um, orientation here in, in a, in a uh, geometric sense. So from emotionally unstable top to emotionally stable bottom, and from introvert left to extrovert um, right. And for each of these psychological, uh, let's call them traits, you have specific physical features dry, cold, hot, and wet. And for each of these, you also have four main descriptors, melancholic, choleric, phlegmatic, and sanguine or sanguinic, each of which are connected to the Greek etymology of the fluids or liquids present in the body. I will not spend too much time on the etymology of these four elements here. We shall continue. But the idea is that if you exist on these four quadrant um, uh, structure, then your presentation in terms of personality, so thoughts, emotions, uh, behavior, will be represented by the connection between these elements. So if you are in between emotionally unstable and introvert, you will be on the melancholic uh, quadrant, and you might be uh, anxious or rigid, etc. If you're an extrovert, but you're also emotionally unstable, you're choleric or so excitable, impulsive, then you're still the extrovert, but at this point you're more stable emotionally, so a stable extrovert, you're sociable, you're lively, you're carefree. And then if you are an introvert, but you are a stable emotionally, then you might be thoughtful, controlled, reliable, etc. All right? So, the interesting thing here is that those four temperaments have been part of human history for, at this point, at the very least, 2,000, probably 3,000 years, okay? In this very structure here. And in the image on the right, you have the medieval representation um, of, um, of um, the, the monastic tradition in Europe. We 
the exact same descriptors. And these are pretty much the same terms that we use in modern day psychology with some caveat, whether those elements are only four and with four words, we can describe all the spectrum of possibilities, or we should add one more, for instance, five, as we can see, the big five is one of the most common viewpoints in this area. Then uh, we at the very least see that there is still a valid um, connotation of the relationship between words, labels, and the way we exist as persons. All right, so are there only four personalities? That might be the question. And in the next, in the next slide, uh, I want to review what we said about type A versus type B um, uh, presentations, and that was more in connection to medicine and physiology. If you think about um, the, the connection between um, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, increased heart rate, and anxiety, for instance, or, or, or aggressiveness. Okay? But in this slide, you see the connection between certain words, certain traits, and a type of personality. Okay? Agreeable, ambitious, cautious, competitive, honest, hostile, and striving. Now, those are connected to type A in this context simply as an example. Okay? This is not to be used in, in, uh, as an explanation, all right? But, but of course, the idea is, okay, we see those words, but does that mean that traits exist in reality or is this just a way that we, we utilize to make sense so we can observe with a possible uh, mistake that we will encounter some confirmation bias? We choose the words, and of course, we're gonna find those words because we artificially apply those words to the personalities of people. Well, there is a debate in modern psychology called the trait situation behave, um, uh, debate, sorry. And um, this is part of many, many uh, research studies. Uh, situationism, for instance, uh, Walter Michel, that I mentioned a few times in regard to the marshmallow test, okay? And he argued that behavior is not really consistent across time or situation. And so can we really talk about personality? Or should we say that behavior is influenced by the context over time? Okay, so this is a debate that's not being uh, solved. But there could be an interactionism, just as much as there is a, a nature-nurture debate. And this interactionism is interaction between both the person, the stable, somewhat stable traits, okay, these internal traits, and the context, the situation. That's what we call uh, person and situation interactionism. But... Uh, what else can we say about it? What other um, researchers have attempted to frame personality in this uh, sense using scales and schemas? One of the most important ones is Hans Eysenck, a German or German-American researcher who believed that many personality traits um, are related to whether a person is mainly introverted or extroverted, so these two angles, right? And whether the person tends to be emotionally stable or unstable. See how this is pretty much the same as what we've seen in the temperaments, right? This four quadrant, right? Now, these uh, characteristics in turn are related to four basic types of temperament, first recognized by the early Greeks and the Romans and the Persians, etc. Okay? So this is just a re-representation of these four elements, melancholic, choleric, phlegmatic, and sanguine or sanguinic types of personality. Another researcher is all ports. Um, or I would say Alpar and Cattell, they're, they're connected to the way um, traits are discussed in modern psychology. Um, according to Alpar, common traits are characteristics shared by most members of a culture, which is a very important thing because we study personality. We have to remember that no man is an island. No man is an island. No human is an island. We live in a context, right? So the multiculturalism, in psychology is essential. Okay, think about uh, some of the research, um, for instance, by, by um, George Gonzalez. Um, uh, and then there are individual traits, which describe a person's unique personal qualities, okay? Not necessarily independent from common traits, but well-defined. And then you have cardinal traits, so basic that all of a person's activities can be traced back to the trait. Cardinal from cardus in, in Latin. And then central traits, core qualities of personality, and then secondary traits, inconsistent or superficial aspects of a person. 
Raymond Cattell, uh, surface traits, features that make up the visible areas of personality, source traits, uh, underlying traits of personality, each reflected in a number of surface traits. And uh, Cattell's created a 16PF personality test, which gives a picture of an individual's personality, as you can see here in this, um, in this uh, image, in this diagram. Uh, three types of professions, airline pilots, creative artists, and writers. And as you can see here on this diagram, on this 16 um, 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 words on its side, you see whether there is some connection or not, okay? So for instance, look at the similarities between, let's say, creative uh, artists and writers toward being imaginative, okay? Or look at some of the connection, let's say, between um, uh, creative artists and writers toward being um, serious or expedient, okay? Lower. Think about them in context of highest score for being outgoing, have abstract thinking, okay? And then look at airline pilots, okay? When they have to be conscientious, very, or relatively high, seven, right? Um, and look at them in the context of being self-controlled, which is not as high in either um, creative artists or writers. So another application of personality in psychology is understanding what makes us a certain way, but also if we have some predictive power for the job that we're going to take in the future. And one of those tests, a test that's really not as much in use in clinical psychology, or it's not used anymore, is the Myers-Briggs test, which is still used in the context of um, uh, finding a career. Now, uh, since we mentioned these two um, great uh, psychologists, um, the, the summary, if you want to think about Alper, is that the, the most important personality traits are those that reflect who we are in terms of our values, okay? So, and again, this is so important because you cannot or you should not separate philosophy from psychology. In Cattell's uh, trait theory, instead, you have, you have things that are um, considered basic, and that's what the 16PF stands for, right? It's 16 basic traits to measure traits, but then you have this the the the, the trait theory that's distinguished in terms of a tripartite structure dynamic ability and temperament so all these numbers in the next slide we find probably the most common way to interpret trait theory from a clinical perspective and a broader perspective the big five by mccray and costa um and they're called big five as the name implies because they involve five main words, five main labels that can be remembered with an acronym, usually OCEAN, okay, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, or as CANU. For each of this, the way the big five were developed, as I mentioned before, was through a semantic analysis. And of course, this is both the strength and the weakness of the big five model. The strength that is non-person specific, non-necessarily um, context dependent is broader, okay? Because it's an, an analysis of semantics of words, narrowing down to the most essential words that create an enough level of knowledge about specific uh, personality. The downside, of course, is because they use the English language and English dictionary in order to do that, this might be limited to some extent to uh, a, an, um, a U.S. framework or at the very least an Anglo-Saxon framework. Although, to be fair, there were several attempts, many of which were successful to translate the Big Five in other languages. To the best of my knowledge, though, all of which Indo-European languages uh, with similar outcomes in terms of predictability and validity, uh, we, okay, of course, we need always to study this more to verify whether the social component plays a bigger role in comparison to the application of the Big Five. But anyway, you, you can score individual in terms of low scores and high scores on a spectrum along these five traits. So if you have a low score for extroversion, okay, you might be more of a loner, you might be more passive and quiet. If you have a high scores in extroversion, you're talkative, you're affectionate. 
if you are presenting with low scores in agreeableness, you tend to be uh, suspicious or critical. High scores instead demonstrate being trusting, lenient, soft heart. Conscientiousness is one of the most important one in terms of the high level of predictability for higher job performance. One of the best in terms of the levels, okay? So if you have a low score on conscientiousness, you might be negligent, lazy, disorganized, etc. But if you have scores, these are really good predictor of how good you're going to be in the job that you pick, assuming that, again, the choice of the job is in itself matching other parameters. But if you are uh, in, in your job and you're presenting with high scores, you're conscientious, you're hardworking, you're well-organized and punctual. Um, neuroticism should not be interpreted as, um, uh, should no longer be interpreted as literally, because uh, in, in pop psychology, very often uh, neurosis is misinterpreted or at the very least misconstructed. I always encourage students to think of neuro and nerves, okay, more from a um, um, biological standpoint rather than a label standpoint. Uh, but if you have low scores of neuroticism, you're calm, even, again, tempered. Think of temperament, okay? The, the, the Romans, the Greeks uh, were still correct. We still use these terms, and not surprisingly, they were, uh, they were uh, so correct because these still hold true. So if you have low scores, you have even temper. Uh, very, very low, of course. You can say unemotional. There's nothing that transpires. But if you have high scores, you may be very temperamental, very worried, etc. And finally, openness to experience, low scores, down-to-earth, uncreative, high scores, imaginative, creative, original, and curious. All right, let's continue. So from the big five, which is one of the most important perspective in uh, personality psychology, and by the way, you can take a test on your own if you'd like, um, that I will add the link um, to this video, um, to a completely different perspective. So this one is uh, trade predicated, war predicated, I would say relatively objective, okay, in terms of the way the study is created, study design and the, the test application, to a very subjective perspective, which is the psychodynamic or psychoanalytic theory perspective. Now, granted, psychodynamic and psychoanalytic are not necessarily synonymous, um, but I put them in the same category because very often they are constructed upon similar, at least from a historical perspective, framework. So, of course, when we think about psychoanalysis, we tend to think of Sigmund Freud. When we think about analytic psychology or analytic psychotherapy, we think of uh, Carl Jung. And, and we in psychodynamic, Jung, Adler, Rize, Horn, etc. are all uh, part of the same uh, basket, so to speak. Um, it's really difficult to sum up all their contributions, so I did my best to uh, present you with just uh, some of the basic elements, and I really encourage you to explore them further if you're interested, especially because psychodynamic psychological theories are the ones that have more to do with things that are less testable, or at least not in the same way, such as subconscious, unconscious, some element of archetypes, spiritual, transcendental elements, and so on and so forth. So Carl Jung, or rather Carl Gustav Jung, personal versus collective unconscious. So there's a lot of studies of both uh, East and West, East and West Europe, as well East and West in general philosophy. And this is connected to other uh, elements of investigation. Think about the social and the cultural framework where Jung operated in Switzerland and and, uh, for instance, the comparison between or, or juxtaposition between karma and dharma and, and also the historical features. Um, Jung was very interested in the development of um, authoritarianism, for instance, and think about 1920s and 1930s Europe with this awakening of the gods of war uh, in Italy and in Germany and, um, and Romania um, and eventually throughout um, the, the European framework, and how this applies to the effect of society, the collective unconscious to the person. And again, balance between introversion and extroversion. Alfred, Alfred Adler, striving for superiority, motivation to master environment. 
notion of an inferiority complex. Again, some remnants, uh, not in a negative sense, of psychoanalytic Freudian components here, but also understanding how this applies in a social context, okay? Mastering the environment, understanding uh, ourselves in terms of what we can do in the, in the environment itself, but how, um, how the environment has a, a notion of, um, how can I say, um, of interaction, okay? So humans are social beings, okay? And so everything about us, every, every, all behavior is socially embedded and everything has a, has a social meaning, okay? Um, and, and that's why Alfred Adler is uh, one of the founders, or perhaps the founder, we should say, of the school of individual uh, psychology, right? And, and, um, and other concepts are connected to his work, like, like the, the, the sense of uh, Gemeinschaftsgefühl, the, the, this, this feeling of uh, belonging of uh, Gemeinschaft is really society or community. So th this social element, okay, uh, family constellation, um, style of life, etc., etc. Okay, um, Claudio Rizzè, um, an Italian um, um, psychoanalyst, psychologist, personalities predicated upon universal, perennial, and archetypical uh, patterns. Some of the most famous concepts developed by Claudio Rizzè are the wild man and the wild woman, uh, this ancestral, again, perennial archetype of who we really are as people, uh, also in juxtaposition to society, not necessarily a society that represses us, as Freud had it, but a, a, an, an archetype that needs to blossom, that needs to manifest itself. Um, and the uh, Percival and the Grail, it's one of the, the topoi, the, the, the archetypical uh, story images or symbols that Claudio Rizzo was instrumental in, in uh, researching in modern psychology. Wonderful researcher. Karen Horney, also fundamental to the discussion, personality is cultural rather than biological. And this, um, uh, it, it's fundamental because it has to do with the progressive emphasis to external factor. So, uh, for, for instance, if you think about anxiety, right, there are strategies that are used to cope with it that can be uh, misplaced, can be abused, overused, and they cause them to take the appearance of needs, okay? So, there are, there are elements that, that have to do with the environment and social upbringing rather than this, this uh, perennial factor. So, um, one of the things is, 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 is this really traditional psychoanalytic? It is, it is in the context of the idea of the neurotic needs, but it, it is not necessarily um, the same, if you think about especially Rizé and Jung, when you think about the concept of society and self-actualization, okay? She believed that self-actualization is the healthy person's aim through life, um, and this is a partial understanding, in, in my view, in comparison to, for instance, the contribution by George Gonzalez that views all of this as important, but there are also other multiple factors, multicultural norms, or uh, Eric Erickson. Again, I'm adding Eric Erickson here from the developmental psychology framework to explain that believe social relationship are the most important factor in personality development, but he also expanded on Freud's ideas, especially the idea of ego and view that as a juxtaposition of two, uh, two poles, two, uh, two fights, so to speak, two, um, uh, how can I say this, two um, um, opposite um, psychosocial, which he labels stages, psychosocial uh, magnets, so to speak, okay? So within Eric Erickson, you have the, the basic conflicts between two poles as the scriptures of each state. So you go from uh, trust versus mistrust when you're, when you're an infant up to one year to autonomy versus shame or doubt in early childhood to initiative versus guilt in the play age, industry versus inferiority when you're between seven and 11, so uh, uh, late school age. And then within adolescence, as you expect, you go from identity uh, in just opposition to confusion. And of course, the virtue here is fidelity. Intimacy versus isolation or adulthood, generativity versus stagnation, and finally integrity versus despair. Uh, again, this is more relevant in a course on developmental psychology, so I will not ask you to remember all of this, but this is uh, 
another element of how personality is developed. To continue, in the next slide, we are talking about analytic psychology and Carl Gustav Jung. Uh, I mentioned his name several times this semester, so um, I encourage you to uh, study uh, his perspective a little more, but uh, as a refresher, as a reminder, there are main elements of his perspective on human psychology and personality that, that we should keep in mind. Um, well, first of all, definition. An introvert person as opposed to an extrovert person. In the first case, a shy, self-centered person whose attention and focus inward and an extrovert, bold, outgoing person whose attention is directed outward. Starting with these two perspectives, I want you to focus on this attention element and this inwardness, this outwardness, and the direction. So that we understand that introverts has to do with the versus, so the direction, the movement, and the overall perspective. Uh, this is also connected to developmental uh, aspect of psychology and even to parenting. Um, for instance, when we think about ethics and morals, the very modern, if not postmodernist perspective would like us to believe that you should focus on your inner core without paying too much attention on the external factor. Now, while this is understandable, because when we think about ourselves, we should think of ourselves first in terms of our uh, shortcomings, our problems, our perspectives, our bias, etc., etc., the rejection of the outside at times also means rejection of objectivity. So that if we consider ourselves the only parameter according to which we can interpret the world, my reality is just as valid as your reality and the other person's reality and the fourth, fifth, sixth person reality so that there is no universal truth. Everybody has one's own truth and therefore we should always be uh, tolerant of any perspective because they're all equally valid. This is a terrible mistake and it's definitely not what Jung has intended. Now, let's focus on the self-concept as opposed to self-esteem. So the self-concept is the way we understand ourselves, your ideas, your perception, feelings about who you are, and your self-esteem is the evaluation process. Now, a positive self-evaluation of ourselves as opposed to a low self-esteem, a negative self-evaluation. Notice that this is not necessarily a moral judgment. The idea that we should only foster high self-esteem is really misplaced. We should have the ability to perceive reality in a spectrum. So the, our estimation itself should be corroborated by objective factors. And this is where these four archetypes play a role. Now, Jungian psychology is really complex, and it's complex for a variety of reasons. First of all, the application of psychology in the context of therapy and uh, personality, but also because it's kind of a hybrid perspective between spirituality, religion, anthropology, mythology even, and modern scientific factors in um, social sciences. And in fact, Jung received criticism from both sides, from the materialistic side, because his analytic psychology was too spiritual, too transcendental, too religious, not empirical, not materialistic, not nihilistic enough. But he also received criticism on theological grounds, where his psychology was uh, built on multiple spiritualities with a kind of a pick and choose process that did not seem to have uh, more solid theological grounds. Now, whether you agree with this or not, one of the greatest contribution uh, of Jung uh, was exactly in questioning the presupposition that Freud had that ultimately led to a very negative uh, outlook in life, uh, a life deprived of superior meaning, of eternal purpose, of universal truth. So that is wonderful about Jungian analytic psychology. What are these four archetypes, these eternal perennial symbols? The self, the center of the human psyche and personality, it unifies consciousness and unconsciousness, representing total unity, God as the higher uh, power, as the uh, prime uh, triune person, often symbolized by a circle image called a mandala, like the image at right you can see here. 
Uh, now, the mandala is a Sanskrit term that you probably are familiar with. Notice that Jung does not here only focus on Eastern philosophy or Western religion. It's a combination. The shadow, the darker side of human nature that embodies chaos and uncontrollable or unacceptable emotions, often represented by devil figures or mysterious enemies. Now, devil figures, again, in the etymological sense of the term, right? The diabolos, the split, okay? Um, so you see how different this is from the Freudian perspective in terms of repression and oppression. Jung really is, is, is instrumental in understanding the ultimate truth as opposed to pseudo-critical theory perspective. And then you have the anima versus animus. Anima, the feminine qualities within a man's personality, and the animus, masculine qualities within a woman's personality. Notice the importance of the binary construct here and how this is really inclusive of multiple dimension. Finally, persona, as the name implies, uh, not just the person or personhood, but the public self, the image or character that a person wants to show to the outside world. Yet again, consider this. This is not necessarily a negative factor, okay? It's not that showing our public self to the world is lying. There's also an ethical dimension to it. We want to show our best self. So these are all fundamental uh, elements of Jungian psychology. As I mentioned, this will really require many, many semesters and further training. Um, I had the privilege, actually, to, to undergo extensive training in um, Jungian uh, analysis, and I really encourage all of you that are interested in psychodynamic perspective, psychoanalytic perspective in psychology to study Jung in depth. But let's continue. Uh, we talked about Jung for quite some time, so I need to mention a few more things about Sigmund Freud, uh, if no other reason that Freud really was one of the um, instrumental uh, figures in, uh, in um, modern psychology. Again, uh, he gets both too much credit for what he accomplished and not enough. Too much credit because a lot of um, current understanding of psychology, of pop psychology, uh, seems to think that Freud really created a lot of uh, uh, new development in, in psychoanalysis, and that's really not true. In fact, I would say that he really owns to uh, Jean-Martin Charcot, uh, the French neurologist, a lot of his perspective, uh, especially in regard to uh, the, the, the scientific research um, on hypnosis um, and, and, and other, and, and other researchers like, like, like uh, Josef Troyer, for instance, or uh, Otto Rank. Um, so th there are a lot of things that uh, might not be known to the, 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 the modern pop psychological uh, world. Um, and, and of course, uh, there were followers, okay? There were uh, followers um, oh, that are represented as such, but sometimes they're more like overlapping uh, research perspective. And, th and that's true for not just you and Karan, but also from uh, Ernst Jones and, and Sandro Ferenczi or, or, or uh, uh, Wilhelm Steckel, uh, Richard von Kraft Ebbing, and many, many others. And, of course, Alfred Adler that we mentioned multiple times, as well as the critics, so I mentioned the fact that Freud gets too much credit, in my estimation, for things that he himself did not come out with, but also not enough credit for the things that he really contributed to establish as the current state of affairs in the pop perception of psychology. Uh, most untrained people tend to think in Freudian terms to this day, uh, um, so that he did make an impact, and unfortunately not in a good sense. A lot of our uh, wrong presupposition of psychology originated in Freud, and one of the best criticism in a negative sense uh, of uh, the shortcomings of Freudian psychoanalysis um, uh, are um, found in the work by Rudolf Ahlers, um, also um, an Austrian or Austro-Hungarian um, um, researcher, doctor, physician, psychiatrist, and so on and so forth. But anyway, a uh, few things about Freud. Uh, when we think about personality, his term is the psyche, which is already somewhat problematic because at this point in our um, um, semester, you should know that psyche is a much more complex concept than just personality. And then he has other terms such as libido, which at first, in the first um, 
uh, approach represent energy, not just sexual energy. It's really an important distinction to make. Then eros, which is not just love, but life instinct, like the preservation of life. This You could say that this should also represent the sacredness of life, Okay, the defense of life, um, the defense of life even at conception. But this sacredness is something that appears to be completely absent or almost completely absent in Freud, which is interesting because the opposite is not absent at all. Thanatos, the death instincts. Now, this is correlated to this pyramid the, uh, the, of the ego, id, and superego uh, that you can see in this image. And on the developmental aspect with these stages, the oral, the anal, the phallic, the latency, the genital stage, all of which are connected to some element of energy and sexual activity in, in children, as you can see in this, in this image here. Now, I don't want to spend too much time about Freud here, but just if someone were to ask, okay, so what, what do you need to remember about Freud in a course in psychology, especially in regard to uh, personality? Well, at, at the very least, the, what, what are the differences between the id, the ego, and the superego, and how he conceptualizes anxieties, defense mechanisms, etc. So as you can look at this image, think of it this way. What is the id? Id is, of course, in German, the equivalent um, uh, would be the is in the German that, that, that Freud used, um, uh, or the um, it, you could say, uh, in, in modern English, sorry. And what, what is this id or is? Uh, it represents this innate biological instinct, these urges. It's self-serving and, according to Freud, completely unconscious because it also works on the pleasure principle. It just wants it to have it and it wants to have it now. It wants to have its desire satisfied now, regardless of the uh, social, personal consequences, etc. So this is the it. The ego, which really means the I in Latin, the ich, right? Or ich, if you want to pronounce in the Berlin dialect. Uh, is the executive power, okay? It's partially conscious because it works on the reality principle, okay? It delays action until it's practical or appropriate for the social context, okay? So it's able to redirect the id. And then you have the super ego or the above I, the über ich, okay? Which is the sensor element. Now, sensor, censorship, you could say in an ethical and moral sense, but according to Freud, definitely moralizing, okay? In fact, Freud argued that the superior comes from our background, from our parents or caregivers. And the, the example he gives is that guilt comes from the superego, as if guilt is intrinsically moralizingly bad, which tells you a lot about the uh, frustrating, problematic rapport that Freud had with really religion, his religious background in particular. And then the superego has two parts. You have the conscience, which reflects actions for which a person has been punished. And this is connected to our discussion on, um, on, on um, conditioning. And the ego idea, which is the ideal with the L, which is the second part of the superego, which reflects the behaviors once parents approved of or, or, or uh, rewarded. Okay, so this is in general. Now, what else can we say about Freud before we, we continue? Well, uh, there are something to, to be said about the dynamics of anxiety, okay? So the ego is always in between, right? There's a battle between the superego and the id. And then you have anxiety as a result of that, neurotic caused by id impulses, right? Moral anxiety, which as you probably imagine has to do with moralizing, so superegos. And then you have these three levels, unconscious, conscious, and preconscious. These anxieties is connected to our defense mechanisms that we do unconsciously or partially unconsciously so uh, in terms of trying to exist in the world. So you have repression, which is pushing unacceptable thoughts into the unconscious, right? So it involves intentional forgetting, but not in a conscious sense. An example would be uh, in the context of PTSD. A, a, a victim cannot recall the specific details of what happened. So this is repression. Regression, which is connected to many aspects of psychoanalysis, regressing uh, to earlier life stages okay, uh, of, of personality development. Then you have reaction formation, okay, replacing something that creates anxiety with the exact opposite, right? So for instance, um, someone who's really 
anxious about um, uh, being uh, anxious about the the presence of authoritarian um, uh, intolerant uh, uh, forms of government he is involved in many I don't know uh, um, extreme left-wing social justice uh, rallies in order to make up you could say for, for, for this, you know, so it's a replacement, okay, uh, which is typically goes overboard. And then you have a rationalization, which is really one of the biggest shortcomings in Freudian perspective, um, which is creating false but believable excuses to justify inappropriate behavior, okay? So uh, you say, I'm doing something that I know to be bad, but after all, I didn't have any other option. So, uh, like cheating, it's it, cheating is is, is 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 okay if you didn't have any other option. Like, for instance, if you cheat on on an exam. Notice that rationalization is exactly the opposite of uh, theory of personalities that we already mentioned. Uh, if you think about Aristotle, the the the, the Stoic, Marcus Aurelius, um, 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 Avicenna, and and uh, Aquinas. Okay, with the rationalization, the highest possible. Um, uh, a cortical force in human beings. Freud looks at that as a very bad thing. Okay, now not because this is not happening. You know, you could definitely see that that we are not able to uh, to hold on to the truth. Okay, so we 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 come up with excuses, but the term itself is pretty telling in, in Freud. Then you have denial, of course. Um, you have displacement, which is the redirection of emotional feeling to a substitute target. Right, so um, you get angry. Uh, and frustrated because of the way you've been treated at work, and you display this anger toward your family, for instance, right? And just similar to projection, okay? Although although projection is a false misattribution, okay, to to others, right? Um, or, or the opposite, which is sublimation, which is a substitution uh, of socially acceptable behavior, which is kind of the roots of of um, heavy sports, for instance, or, or video games, okay? So those are all things uh, about Freudian um, personality. Now, in terms of the development, as I mentioned, you have all these stages, starting with the oral stage. And if you would like to find out more about it, I'll be happy to discuss that. But in the context of this lecture, if you could just take a look at this, this, uh, this um, uh, image, that, that's all I want you to, to know for now. The, the general idea is this. Why do we need to use Freudian psychoanalysis, according to Freud? To go from the unconscious stage, the unconscious mind, which have all these repressed thoughts, right? The, all these memories and repressed emotion, to the conscious mind, to bring this to the conscious mind and acknowledge that, which is liberating. Now, this part is something that even Jung would agree with. In fact, most psychologists would agree with that. The fact that all of these things are negative by definition, in a moral sense, is something that really does not hold um, in uh, um, the current state of affairs, both in research and also in the light of thousands and thousands of philosophical understanding. Okay. Um, now, what 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 else can we say about that? Well, that this defense mechanism, by definition, can be habitual and unconscious. So there is some sort of rehearsal. Think of. Uh, habitual as both a habit but also the habitus you become what you display in behavior okay that's an essential part of, of psychotherapy uh, if you have a chain reaction between everything you do every day you will become what you do every day i mentioned this a few times if you if you're trying to get rid of a problem you need to detox your soul, so to speak, just getting rid of all the negativity, uh, for instance, by swearing. But if all you do is venting, sharing, and swearing, you will become the anxiety. You will become the, quote-unquote, swearing activity. You need to replace that with a healthy perspective, which is exactly what Freudian psychoanalysis seems to completely miss. All right. Um, to continue, there are many, many other personality theories, and again, I just want to mention the most important ones. Behavioral personality theory, which is a model personality that emphasizes learning and observable behavior, behaviorism, right? Learning theory, or learning theories, uh, that be believes that learning shapes our behavior and explains personality, okay? Now, uh, notice here that there is a cognition and there's learning. Some of these terms are somewhat arbitrarily divisive or divided uh, because you could say that if behaviorism and conditioning is connected to learning, right? 
but there is a difference between the behavioral aspects in themselves as opposed to the learning, which has to do with more of a control element, right? Uh, learning in the sense as nature versus nurture. And of course, situational determinants, which is connected to uh, all the things we said about uh, the, the context-dependent uh, approach. Now, other names, Dollar and Miller theories, habits are learned behavioral patterns, makes up structure of personality, and they're governed by drive, any stimulus strong enough to, um, um, uh, to motivate a person into action, right? Uh, so like hunger, for instance. And then you have the Q, uh, which has to do with signals from the environment that guide responses, the response itself, any behavioral, internal or observable action, and then, of course, reward the positive reinforcement. You should be familiar with that as well. In this context, if you want to look at the developmental perspective, just as we did with Freud earlier, there are four critical childhood situations, feeding, toilet or cleanliness training, sex training, and learning to express anger or aggression in this sequence. Other theory, the one by uh, Rotter, or the SLT, the social learning theory, an explanation that combines learning principles, cognition, and the effect of social relationship. Psychological situation, how the person interprets or defines the situation. Again, learning is exactly this. It's a social element to this uh, learning element. Expectancy, anticipation that making a response will lead to reinforcement. Reinforcement value, this may some, be something new that you did not encounter before. Subjective value attached to a particular activity or reinforcer. So see how these two things come together. There's an evaluation, estimation, interpretation based on subjective elements. And then self-efficacy and self-reinforcement. This is connected to uh, humanistic and positive psychology in a slightly different way in comparison to the authors that we already encountered, okay? Uh, Desi, for instance. Self-efficacy, capacity for producing a desired result, okay? Now, this is very important because it's connected to the triad that we mentioned in, um, in week one. Efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness, okay? So you have to keep in mind that you need to be careful what you wish for. This is just a capacity for producing a desired result, regardless, unfortunately, on the fact that if you obtain this result, this might not be intrinsically good for you, right? Um, which leads to the contemporary catastrophe in narcissistic behavior, where we are the only uh, uh, judges of our own happiness, uh, health, and morality. And then self-reinforcement, praising or rewarding oneself for having made a particular response, for instance, getting a good grade. So in this context, since we're talking about social learning theory, we do have a reinforcement, which is a social reinforcement, praise, attention, or approval from others, okay? And then identification, feeling emotionally connected to admire adults, role models, and imitation, desire to act like an admire person, which in turn becomes our role model. Now, since we mentioned Rotter, we had to mention Carl Rogers, right? Um, um, now, patient-centered, positive psychology, and humanist psychology are not synonymous, but they're very often put in the same category. And um, these are also the origin of uh, health coaching, health and wellness coaching, uh, motivational interviewing, which technically speaking is not really psychotherapy. Uh, it's not really, I would say, solid psychology. Uh, if you want to find out more about that uh, and whether this is clinically and scientifically sound or not, feel free to um, uh, send me your question and comments. I'll be happy to discuss motivational interviewing and, and health coaching in depth. I've been teaching that for many, many years. Uh, so there are, are a few things that I'm very critical about, and, and I'll be happy to elaborate on that. But for the purpose of this lecture, I just focus on, on the main aspect, uh, starting with Carl Rogers, okay? If you want to sum up Carl Rogers, you need to look at this image here. Incongruence versus congruence. Terms that are essential if you are practicing psychotherapy. Congruent mood, congruent behavior, etc. Whether it's this, this connection, this in, in integrity, as well as this unified element, as opposed to the dissociated, disintegrated element, okay? Incongruence, ideal self, self-image, and true self, and congruence all in one. Okay, this unifying element. 
in progress. So does this apply? Well, a fully functioning person lives in harmony with his or her deepest feelings and impulses. The self is flexible in changing perception of one's identity. Flex, notice here, flexible, okay, not fluid, okay, flexible, okay. Self-image, total subjective perception of your body and personality, okay, which is, of course, predicated upon personal experience, okay. Incongruence instead exists when there is a discrepancy between one's experiences and self-image. So the fact that you, you perceive this as a, as a separation is in itself pathological, okay? It's really important to understand that. When we use the term pathological, we don't mean to say immoral or bad. We need to use this term in a clinical sense. That's really liberating. That's where the healing process help, uh, starts, okay? Th those two things are not completely separated, but it's important to uh, be precise in the way we define them. And then the ideal self, the idealized image of oneself, the way you would like to be, okay? And you can see that there might be some level of integration or disintegration, okay? So this determines the positive self-regard, okay? Which is the overall moral element we need to have. Thinking of oneself as good, lovable, worthwhile person. And the unconditional positive regard, unshakable love and approval. Notice the essential part here. As a therapist, you need to display all these traits. You need to uh, be open, loving, and caring for whomever person you are dealing with or treating. Okay? This does not mean essential. Please pay attention here. Loving and caring for your friends, for your patients, for your clients, okay, means to love them and help them blossom, become the, their best self, okay. It does not mean that you need to affirm whatever they're saying to you because your job as a therapist is not a job of affirming, but healing, clarifying, shedding light, helping them becoming who they're supposed to be, okay. Because you might affirm a very bad idea. For instance, if a person comes to you and this person is suicidal, you don't want to affirm, affirm false thoughts. You don't want to affirm lies. This is extremely important, okay? This is the ultimate love. This is the ultimate unconditional positive regard. You need to have positive self-regard because, as Jung would say, you are made in the image of God, or at the very least, you have a divine spark. So you are your by definition, a good person. This does not mean that everything about you is positive. You can make mistakes. A lot of your behaviors can be compromising your health, your morals, and the health and the morals of others, okay? You can be a horribly behaved person, okay? So when you have a positive self-regard, this has nothing to do with narcissism. You need to be very careful in understanding this distinction. Few more things uh, which are connected to the next slide. Condition of worth, internal standard evaluation used by children, and this is precisely why it's a developmental stage, okay? We need to learn and know best, or at least know more as we become older. Uh, organismic valuing, natural understory, full body reaction to an experience. And then, you know, the, the idea is that you that there is a there's a connection. How can I say there's a connection between the way uh, things are and the way things ought to be? Okay, there's a teleological um, aspect here, which is, is much better described in the next slide. Now, here I, I made a comparison between uh, Abraham Maslow on the right and Robert Spitzer on the left. Um, whether you call this the pyramid of needs, of human needs, a pyramid of self-actualization, etc., Abraham Maslow, uh, one of his fundamental contribution is the fact that without the base of the pyramid, you cannot have the top of the pyramid. Okay, um, but but you need to understand there are two polar uh, magnets, poles, the pull toward the top, which is the thing you need to strive for. And to be fair, Abraham Maslow, in the first version of the pyramid, did not make room for transcendence, okay? Which is really concerning because it doesn't matter how self-actualized you are, even if you do everything, so to speak, right in your life, you are not enough to yourself. In order to be healthy, in order to heal, 
you need to remove some of the improper pressure toward yourself. Even if you do everything right, this is not enough. We are not enough to ourselves. We need to find a transcendental element. Traditionally speaking, this transcendental element is usually referred to as the divine element by definition, God. Okay. Now, you might argue that you don't need this necessarily in this framework, but the point is that even if you accomplish everything in life, you have a great job, money, respect, good family, eventually you will have to leave all this behind. So this is not enough. Okay. Now, Abraham Maslow did a wonderful job in describing this in personality terms anyway, because again, if you only talk about transcendence, okay, if you talk about self-actualization or aesthetic needs, then you might not have the solid rock upon to which you should build the house of your personality, of your psychology. Okay? But if you don't have your physiological needs met, if you don't have enough food, you don't have shelter, you cannot sleep, okay, you don't have safety, etc., then nothing else can happen. So you need both. You need to nurture your soul on the top and your body on the bottom. Okay. Now, this is a simplified uh, um, version of things, but an even better description of thing is this pyramid of or levels of happiness, which is what you can find on the right side. Now, in the immediate gratification, okay, uh, the, the number one, it's very similar to physiological needs. It's also very similar to what Freud would have this attributed to the id, right? The objective is pleasure and minimization of pain, okay? Notice that, first of all, you have an immediate gratification, okay? And the obligation is to self alone. No desire for common, intrinsic, or ultimate good. Lack of self-worth, fear of tangible loss or harm, and boredom. I must say this, that a lot of our psychological issues in our modern Western U.S. culture is due to the fact that we are stuck in number one. We are very narcissistic, even though we perceive ourselves as alone, lonely, and suffering. Okay? First of all, the issue with number one is that you only focus on this immediate resolution of your problem. You don't see the bigger picture. And this projects number two, the comparative personal achievement. Now, okay, at this point, you... You see others, but others really, other people are really only understood in terms of competitiveness, okay? Promotional self is primary. Personal power and control are key. Jealousy, fear of failure, contempt, isolation, loneliness, and cynicism. Our modern world is wrong, and that is why it's so cynical. Plus, think of it. If everything about life is competition, you don't even enjoy the, the pattern. You don't even enjoy the path because... You're always afraid that you're going to be thrown under the bus next, okay? You're so consumed by yourself because you always think of yourself, paradoxically, as low. And this is really low self-esteem. You're always afraid that something bad will happen, okay? And this is also part of, unfortunately, this obsession the modern society has with social media, okay? Think of selfies. Think of whatever, whatever the current social media platform is. I don't want to measure any of them with a purpose. Everything is superficial and it's shallow and it's doomed to fail because it's not built on truth. It's not built on a solid rock. A much better level of real happiness, real meaning and purpose in life is number three, contributive. First of all, gratification is long-term. So you already have the fact that you're gratified. You're rendered what? Gratis, right? Gratie in Latin. So you're rendered, you're made to be grateful, also gracious about life, okay? Gratefulness and, and gratitude do good beyond self. Altruism, alter in, in Latin means the other, right? The other person. Do good beyond self. Make an optimal, positive difference for others. If you sacrifice your life for others, you will gain so much more than if you focus on yourself alone, okay? Sacrifice does not mean having inappropriate boundaries, by the way, okay? We talk about this when we when we discuss cluster B personality traits. Um, Self-sacrifice means to make yourself engage in a sacred, in a, in a, in a, I would say in a, in a, in a spiritual, in a, in a higher level behavior, you care for others. 
Okay, that's our. We are made to love as people. Characteristic principle include love, of course, community, and justice. Intrinsic goodness is an end in itself. Decisions are focused on the greater good. Now, this is the part of this social justice movement, which is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's not just pointing fingers. It's healing. It's doing good beyond self. Now, of course, doesn't matter how many parades you're involved in. doesn't matter how many social justice activities you're involved in. This is not enough. It's number three. Okay. Going beyond self is great because you include others. You're not self-centered anymore. But people are people. This is limited. The next level up is the ultimate good. Ultimate in terms of universal, perennial, eternal, always true. Participating, giving, and receiving ultimate meaning, goodness, ideals, and of course, the highest possible level of love. Also connected to agape, we could say in Greek. Good is ultimatized. Principles include ultimate truth, love, justice, and beauty. Think of what we said so far about Aquinas. See, Th those things are eternally true. And yet again, something is true, not because it's old or because it's new, but because it's true. It's enduring and eternal. All right. Now, this is all wonderful from a theoretical perspective, but you might wonder, okay, Assuming that all these theories contribute some to our understanding of personality, but how, how do we know whether they're applicable? How, how can we test them? Okay, Are there personality tests? Well, the answer is, of course, there are. And how, how can we assess personality? Well, first of all, we need to understand which theory of personality we want to embrace. And there are two big families here. Leaving aside everything we said about, uh, again, Aristotle, uh, Avicenna, and, and Aquinas, the two main modern perspective, one is, of course, the, the more empirically based, um, um, trait-based uh, personality theory, and the other one is more the psychodynamic or psychoanalytical, right? So, uh, or analytical, so Jung, Freud, etc. If we talk about traits, this is very easy to test. Now, by easy, I don't mean necessarily that it's um, consistent or valid, although some of the, the tests are definitely uh, uh, utilized because they have a higher predictive powers, but those are connected to personality inventories, okay? So personality tests, and this is what we discuss in the next slide, personality tests and assessment. So to give an example here, when we think about personality tests, we are not only talking about a person in isolation, we always talk about a social context, and that's why here, yet again, I talk about Albert Bandura, this triad, if you remember, okay, um, of the SCT uh, theory, right, the social cognitive theory, when you have per behavioral, personal, and environmental factors, all which play a role in personal development, okay? But in general, how do we test personality? Well, here are a few ways to do that, um, and that's how we exactly we do that in, in a clinical setting when we perform personality tests. Um, and why would do we personal we do perform these personality tests? Well, first of all, because a person might be interested in, in understanding themselves better, but also in order to have some contribution to the research, to clinical aspect, and even to legal aspects. For instance, to verify whether a person might be more or less prone to uh, portray uh, himself or herself under a different light, either worse than they really are or better than they really are, uh, whether the concept of lying or telling partial truth is predicated upon personality traits or not, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we test personality? We have personality assessment, which involves the techniques for systematic gathering information about a person in order to understand and predict behavior. So if you have a specific type of personality, you would expect to behave a certain way in this context, in this situation. And then the goal of this personality assessment is, of course, because we're talking about psychology as a science, to obtain reliable and valid measure of individual differences that will permit the accurate prediction of behavior. How you do that? Three main steps, okay? Interview, observation, and test. The interview is essential. You can never administer any test without meeting the person, okay? And even if you meet the person once or twice, you need to have a solid grasp on the person in general, not just uh, on the prediction of the test itself. Plus, there's always um, um, a regression to the median so that, that when you do a personality test, you might take a test once 
and you may have all these outliers in your responses. But if you take a test again and again, even though the order of the question may not be the same, you tend to go back to the midline. So your outliers are not so far off anymore. You tend to be more within the norm. It's a common, common uh, psychological um, consideration, this, this, this regression to the mean, right? So it's not enough to perform a test. It's not enough to observe a person in behavioral uh, context. You also need to talk to the person, okay? That's how a good psychologist, um, or at the very least, a good psychiatrist can uh, say anything about personality, okay? So um, um, what examples do we have? Well, you have the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventories, which is the most widely used personality uh, inventory, okay? Uh, which assess psychological disorders, not... So it's able to separate the disorder from the normal quote-unquote trait, and it's empirically derived. What does it mean? Well, the, the test items were selected um, upon how well they were discriminating, statistically speaking, between group of traits, okay? So this is the MMPI. Uh, the, um, the 16 PF that we mentioned before, the, the, the 16 personality factor questionnaire, um, uh, and the, the NEO-PI, the NEO uh, personality inventory. Now, when we think about this objective personality measure, I want to be clear here. When we think about objectivity, we don't, we always think of statistical terms, okay? This is objective, not because it's always true, but because it's objective in comparison to the subjective element, which is usually associated with other types of tests that have to do with psychodynamic, psychoanalytic fo uh, um, um, focus. Here you have an example of the uh, Rorschach ink block test, which by definition has to do with interpretation, subjective interpretation of this, uh, this ink blot. Okay, it's, it's a pro projective psychological test. And that's again, another term I want you to remember. This projection, what do you mean projection? In psychoanalytic or analytic terms, the subject's perception of this, these images, these ink blots are recorded and then analyzed using psychological interpretation. Um, and of course, this is not the only one. You can also use uh, um, algorithm, etc. cetera. And, um, and this of course has to do uh, with the, one of the, the founding fathers of this, this um, um, practice, which was um, this, uh, another uh, uh, Swiss, just as Jung, right? This, uh, this uh, researcher, his name was uh, um, um, Hermann Rorschach, um, who, who was both a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, just as uh, uh, Jung uh, was, uh, Carl Gustav Jung. And, um, and uh, he's also instrumental, not just in the field of psychology, psychoanalysis, um, uh, psychology testing, but also psychometrics, which is I exactly the, the focus here. Now, um, while the Rorschach inkblot test is very often criticized, um, especially in the U.S., I would say, uh, it's widely used, and it's a great, really a great um, tool to, to target all those areas of personality that unfortunately are missed by more objective tests, such as the MMPI-2, okay? So... Uh, it should never be a question of either or. Multiple tests, multiple methodology. If you find the same uh, presentation, the same traits, then you have a really solid case for that person. So, um, so if the behavioral assessment is essential, so is the interview and the personality test. So to, to sum up, so you have personality tests, which are objective in terms of questioner, and then subjective in terms of projective that, that you're, you're projecting something on what you observe subject in terms of the subject you treat and the interaction between the interpretation and this analysis and then you have the interview and then you have the behavioral observation which is separate but connected to the behavioral assessment which is which is based on the principle of learning theories and, and has to do with direct measurements of behavior now um do you have also self-report measures yes of course you can ask people uh, about a range, a sample range of the behavior, and then you make inferences about that, and um, and um, and and then you need to have some sort of uh, structure. You need to have s some uh, sample items. For instance, in the in the MMPI two, you have uh, s some statements. You have like, I usually feel that life is worthwhile and interesting. Okay, 
if you margins as false, that leads to depression as as an as a statistical outcome. Uh, other elements, other example might be a sentence such as "I seem to hear things that other people can't hear." If you have this as true, this is more linked to, for instance, schizophrenia. But again, you always need to use this in context. Plus, you have a lot of questions there, so it's not just one question like a uh, a social um, platform, social media type of a pop psychological test. Okay. Now. So while this is researched and validated multiple times, um, so you write target issues of replicability, uh, validity, um, and so on and so uh, so forth. But what about the pro projected personality test? Isn't this too ambiguous? Isn't this stimulus too ambiguous? Well, that's actually the strength because the the, the, the ambiguous stimulus, this ink blot, for instance, allows the test taker to project their their, their feelings, their dreams, their, their needs into their response. And you could also consider this as an integrative approach, which is exactly what we discuss, uh, we will discuss next week when we talk about art therapy or dance movement therapy. Okay. Now, um, one of the assumptions, of course, of this projective test, like the Rorschach Inkblot test, is that uh, th there are some psychoanalytic assumptions, especially the fact that not everything can, can be manifested consciously. So you need to work on the unconscious elements and you do this uh, via the utilization of images, for instance, which makes a lot of sense neurologically speaking based on what we said about corpus callosotomy, the differences and interaction between the right and left hemisphere, this bigger picture as opposed to the detail um, approaches that the brain has, okay? Now, uh, those are just example, okay? Um, I mentioned project tests, uh, and, and I really only mentioned that the Rorschach test, but next we will talk about um, um, other other approaches, for instance, in our therapy, uh, the house three person approach, for instance. Um, but the other one is very, uh, very famous is the TAT, the, the thematic apperception test, uh, which has to do with stories about ambiguous picture that are used to draw inferences about the, the patient's personality. Uh, and there are some hybrid tests, some cognitive tests that utilize both words, uh, tasks, and images. Um, from a cognitive perspective, you could think of the MOCA test, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, which, which is essential to understand that. But of course, this is used in a slightly different clinical setting, not as a personality test. And so when I, when I juxtapose objective tests versus projective tests, or subjective tests, again, not because one is better than the other or the other one is more scientific than the other, but one because it's based on subjective individual perception. The other one is based on traits, okay, trait theory. Uh, the MOCA test has to do with, with the detection of, of mild cognitive impairment. So see how th this, is, this is also structured on a functional perspective okay so one is personality itself so we're not talking about good or bad personalities but different types of personality traits on a spectrum here versus when we think about cognitive impairment we're talking about something that went wrong so there is a clinical judgment that of course it's still on, on a scale a mathematical scale but it's not a question of differences in terms of um, um uh, manifestations, but levels of performance, okay? Um, and, 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 and the MOCA test, because I mentioned that was validated um, for, again, for, for MCI, my content impairment, and, and, um, and, um, and it, it's, it's used with a very specific um, intent, clinically speaking, okay? So it's, it's not something that is supposed to be understood as as an alternative, the focus is different. But in any case, in the next slide here, we see the Yohari window, often mispronounced as Johari window, despite the fact that it comes from the name of Joseph Luft and Harrington Ingham, okay? So you might call it Joseph Luft, and that's how you get Johari. Um, but in any case, this has to do with another type of uh, approach that uh, is connected to the way we project ourselves or we manifest ourselves, we present ourselves to others. It's a, it's a framework, right? 
again, is this projective? Is this objective? Well, it's it's a it's a framework for understanding the bias, the conscious and unconscious bias. Okay, a, a, a visual representation of what a person might or might not know about uh, about herself. Okay, and, and and you juxtapose this, juxtapose this to the way other people uh, look at yourself, which is what we were discussing at the beginning of this lecture. How do I know that the way I appear is the same as the way other people uh, see me, right? And, and this is pretty straightforward. And um, and um, uh, you, uh, you, you can use this in uh, a clinical sense, if not in a clinical context, but also to develop self-awareness or, or for uh, business or, or industrial um, um, areas, organizational areas to improve understanding and uh, with, with your colleagues, for instance, work or, or, or better frame interpersonal relationships. So in any case here, it's pretty straightforward. Things that you might uh, say will be uh, interpreted, okay? And you have two sets of, uh, um, of um, the scriptures here. So um, you, you might have uh, one way of interpretation that's your own, okay? Um, and um, and another, another interpretation, which is the person that, that uh, the, the person perspective on you. So in practice, you, you have a, you have a, um, a list, a number of adjectives that are chosen from a list, okay? And uh, you, as a subject, you will choose the ones that you feel describe your personality best, okay? Now, then you have a peer or peers that will get the exact same list and each picks an equal number of adjectives that describe, in this case, you, the subject, right? And then you insert those adjectives in this grid, in this two by two grid, this, this four quadrants, these four cells, okay? And, um, and you, you might have this, 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 this um, attribution that might or might not tell you whether the way you think you appear to others matches the way others see you, right? So again, you have this, this open area, right? The, the first one that's known to self and known to others, right? So if, if we, are, we are open books in a sense, right? It's an open area that's part of our conscious self, right? And then you have the hidden area below, which is known to me, but no, no, it's not known to anybody else. It's kind of a facade, right? It's, 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 uh, there are adjectives that are selected by me, but by not by any of my peers, right? So um, they are, these are things that either other people are unaware about me or they're untrue, but for what I claim them to be true, okay? And then you have top right, things that are not known to me, to myself, but are known to others, right? These represent what others perceive, but I don't. I'm not aware of that. People think of me as callous and arrogant, and I'm not aware of that at all. I thought it was really kind and nurturing. And finally, not known to me, not known to self, and not known to others, unknown, okay? Neither the subject nor the peers selected this, okay? They represent the subjective behaviors or if you want to use a Freudian framework, the motives, okay, either because they do not apply or or because they're ignorance, they don't know. And of course, among these adjectives, you have things that are very precise but also broad enough, right? You have things such as independent, cheerful, proud, nervous, accepting, energetic, self-assertive, witty, uh, self-conscious, sensible, uh, idealistic, happy, giving. So um, it's it's. Um, it's connected to this concept of meta emotions, right? The concept of these meta emotions are categorized by basic emotions, and 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 it's a there's a motivational element here. So you can find a lot of these tests um, in in uh, in on the internet, but it's another way to frame personality in terms of what is manifested outside, what is perceived by others, as opposed to what we are not aware of. Then I also mentioned the Myers-Briggs uh, Briggs Type Indicator, MBTIs, because it's probably, if not the most uh, famous, uh, at least in the U.S., okay? Uh, it's one of those tests that <clears throat> you can find everywhere, literally everywhere on, on, on social media. And, and if you're, even if you are never uh, um, utilize one of these tests, you probably... You probably have heard of some of these this, uh, four-letter acronyms, ISTP, ISFP, INTP, etc., where E is for extraversion, I for introversion, um, S for sensing, N for intuition, 
T for thinking, F for feeling, J for judging, and P for perceiving, right? And, and then you have these four main brackets. Like the first one, are you outwardly or inwardly focused? Extroverted, introverted. How do you prefer to take information? Sensing or intuition. How do you prefer to make decision? Thinking or feeling. How do you prefer to live your outer life? Judging or perceiving. Okay, so those are the four, four uh, uh, quadrant, okay? And, uh, and of course, it's called uh, Myers-Briggs test due to the work of Catherine Cook-Briggs and Isabel Briggs-Myers, right? Uh, which, again, based their work on Carl Jung writing, okay, in psychological types. So um, I just want to mention this, that, that they're, they're, they're based on psychoanalytic perspective, or even better, analytic psychology perspective. So people are fundamentally different. Uh, people are fundamentally alike. People have preference combination of extroversion, introversion, perception, and judgment, okay? Um, so, uh, in terms of the, the preferences, this has to do with the, the, the focus, right? So, as I mentioned, uh, extroversion, introversion, how one re-energizes, that's how it represents, sensing or intuiting, how one gathers information, thinking or feelings, how one makes decision, judging or perceiving, how one orients uh, himself or herself to the world, right? So, you might have, on top of this, all these acronyms, okay? And please feel free to take a test uh, on uh, on the internet, but know that this test is really not used as much in a clinical setting. So don't, don't, don't diagnose yourself at home, as we would say, but it may be useful in terms of exploring, thinking, uh, or pondering what to do uh, in the future for an internship, for a job, for volunteering uh, opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, you 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 have these 16 personalities and four dichotomies that helps this. So you might have, um, I don't know, sensation th thinkers, ST, which focus on hard facts, they're realistic, goal-oriented, but can be impatient and jump into action quickly. You may have intuitive thinkers, NT, change agents, responsive to creativity, but can be unreasonable and unaware of others. You may have sensation feelers, okay? No sensation thinker is but feelers, SF, practical and caring, good understanding of system, but can be reluctant to accept change. Then instead of intuitive thinkers, you may have intuitive feelers, and F, right? Um, so you may have personal charisma and commitment to others. You may have many ideas, but trouble with uh, implementation. So those are just a few uh, um, uh, examples here where, where uh where you can uh, conceptualize the Myers-Briggs tests. Um, and, um, and of course, you, you have multiple other tests of personality uh, that you can find uh, on or off the internet. Um, and, um, and another one that I really did not mention in this slide would be the, the curiosity temperament sore uh, that, that is also uh, very much uh, discussed in, in uh, in um, in psychology, simply because it's really connected to the 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 the, the four temperaments, right? We measured the four temperaments in, in Galen and, and and Hippocrates in the Romans and the Greeks and then measured in Avicenna, but um, of course in in um, th these four temperaments, th this matrix of humor is slightly different. You have a guardian, idealist, artisan, or rational, in David Kidder's interpretation, um, and um, this, this is really uh, uh, um, more on more on the, the behavioral outcome rather than 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 the the ontological reality itself okay so uh, it, it's first of all it's a self-assessment okay it's a questionnaire but it received a lot of a lot of criticism as well all, all the way to being a, a pseudoscience so you know I, I did not want to include it here um, um, in a in a in a lecture about personality and uh, um, and uh, psychotherapy. Now uh, there could be so much more to say, uh, especially because the psychotherapeutic portion uh, it's only uh, relevant here on the premise that we discussed so far. So I didn't give you any specific example of how to conduct therapy. I did mention many times dialectic behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, REBT, ACT, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we will continue this type of uh, analysis, this part of the conversation next week, 
but it will be impossible to do that unless you have a solid grasp on what do we define as personality? How can we answer the question? Is there just one personality? Are personalities multiple? Can we talk about a spectrum? Uh, what about intersection or intersectionality? What about uh, testing? What about uh, understanding? And what about the type of test we utilize in a clinical setting? Are we talking about something that's fully scientifically empirical, different between objective and projective? Uh, and as you remember, we have divided the modern psychological approach into these two main categories. One, on the level of analyzing words, labels, traits, and on the other side, the more uh, subconscious, preconscious, conscious base, which is at the center of both uh, analytic, psychoanalytic, and psychodynamic uh, therapy and psychology. All right, great. So this concludes uh, week 11. Thank you very much for your patience. Again, uh, an introductory element to psychotherapy. Next week, we will uh, delve even more deeply into psychotherapeutic modalities, and we will see in practice how all these theories of personalities, how all these tests will uh, be applied in the context of a clinical session. So uh, thank you very much. I will see you all in week 12. Bye-bye.